Vince Dancioni. You're a man with a lot of insight into the stock markets. You've been trading for over 30 years now. Tell us a little bit about yourself and your background. Okay, so I started out uh, even before trading. My family was Italian, my dad was a hairdresser. Um, and I've always been interested in money. I was the kid at school that was always buying and selling things. So as well as going to school, buying and selling things, I used to help my dad out in the hairdressing shop, sweeping up, washing hair, and also doing the payroll. So I started to get interested in, in business because of, you know, through my dad. And I also was buying and selling computer games. And that was probably my first sort of spread bet in that what I would do, Alex, I'd buy a game from you for two pounds and sell it to somebody else for three pounds. And then when they fed up with it, buy it and sell it again. And this is back in the old days when we used to have the ZX Spectrum games were on tape. Um, so I always had that sort of buying and selling entrepreneurial sort of flair, make money because I never got pocket money. You know, my parents view as well, you know, you've got to earn your own keep and, uh, you know, don't expect anything, which was great. It was, it was a good culture. So that was my first sort of into like making money was from school. I got interested in shares back in 1983, 84, which is when the UK started having privatizations. And the first one was BT. Um, so I started getting, you know, thinking, oh, you know, this is interesting. This company's being sold off. There's an opportunity. Now I was too young to buy shares, but I had a bit of money saved up. So I got my dad to buy some. He thought it was a stupid idea, um, but we applied for the new issues. And for those who don't know, in the UK, a lot of companies were being sold off part of the Thatcher government. You had British Gas, you had British Telecom. Um, so that's how I started my very, very first insight into shares. And obviously got the bug for, oh, this is interesting, and started following the shares. Um, I was no sort of big student. I knew I wanted to leave school pretty early. And there was two things I was going to do. I was going to be a chef. Um, because I was always interested in cooking and eating. But then I realised, and this is back in the day when really chefs weren't earning that much money, but I realised it'd be a long slog. Or I was thinking maybe go and work in a bank, something with computers, because I was interested in computers. Now, by chance, I watched, I did all the usual applications, you know, as a school leaver at 16. Um, I watched a programme on BBC Two, which is actually still on the internet now. And it was called 24 Hours, and it was about foreign exchange, and they followed a dealer, um, there was the foreign exchange market 24 hours a day. Talk about fate. Within about two weeks, I had an interview with NatWest in London at the uh, NatWest Tower, as it was um, at the time. And so she said, oh, you know, what do you know about this? And, then, and of course, I'd watched this program a couple of nights before, and this, you know, way before internet days. So all of a sudden, I know quite a bit about the market. So obviously I didn't tell her I'd watched a program a night before. And I thought this interview had gone quite badly because she was really hard. And I thought, oh, you know, what have I done? You know, I remember I'm, this time, I'm not even 16 yet because my birthday's in August. Um, so I thought, oh, well, you know, there you go. Some, some you win, some you lose. Anyway, whether they were desperate for staff or whatever, about two weeks later, I get a letter through offering a position. And I'd also had a letter through, I'd had a job with BP as well in Moorgate working in computers. And it was almost nearly, which one do you go for? So I went for the NatWest one. Um, and... I'd started off as a junior, as a runner, in a foreign exchange, um, something called the World Money Centre, very, very similar to what I'd watched on the programme um, those few weeks ago. So that is exactly how I started. And it was horrible, Alex. It was a horrible job. And you know, like, when they say you can't go home once you've left. I still was living at home at the time. but So my dad said, oh, what's it like? So, oh, it's really good. I'm doing great things and all the rest of it. But it was so what my job entailed was getting lunches for the dealers, and this time there was no smoking ban. So you walked into that dealing room and there was a plume of smoke. It was, and these guys were on 60 a day. And as I say, if you, if you search on YouTube, it's still there. The Barclays dealing room, you see the guys are smoking all day. Uh, so I was getting lunches, being treated really badly. Um, foreign exchange deals uh, used to be done with telex in those days. Um, we had Reuters screens, but Telex was, so you had these big rolls of paper and you had to put it on there. And the news stories used to be like on a teleprinter. So a story about something happened from Reuters, it would print it up. I would rip that off, give it to the dealer, see if it was interesting or not. Um, so really, really bad jobs. Um, and most people within sort of six months, they give up, they quit. And they just treat you badly. I'm making a hundred pounds a week, which even back in those days, it was terrible, and I was spending 26 pounds a week to get there on the train. Um, but I stuck it because partly I didn't want to go back and be a hairdresser. And from there, it built up. 
and snowballed. I went on to deal uh, foreign exchange currencies, got started with the currency market, then started dealing in stocks. So my whole career basically built up from being a junior. So you're a junior, you're involved in the market, are you having a little go yourself at this stage? Yeah, I'm still doing a few little trades on the side with what money I had. I was learning as much as I could. The other thing is um, the banks were always big spenders on computers. So we had access to a lot of computer power. Because you gotta remember back in those days, what your phone does now, our big mainframes probably did a fraction of that. And you had these big rooms and they had to be cooled and uh, they were huge. So computer power was very expensive and you need a lot of space. So I got a chance, I could start using some of the computers that they had um, in the off sort of peak time. Um, so that's how I sort of got involved in there. I, Built up, I went to work, well actually one of the pe people that worked for NatWest went to go and work for an American bank, said, oh look, I'll double your salary, and I thought, okay. So I went with him, um, I worked for a couple of other banks, and then I got into um, stocks, working uh, in stocks, and that, and that was 87, uh, in October 87, so you might know, was the stock market crash. And unfortunately, I started to believe my own hype. I had a lot of positions open on credit, um, so I wasn't spread betting yet in those days, but what we had was margin trading. So you could buy stock and not have to pay for it for 25 days. So as long as the stock moved up, you could sell it, redo it, and buy it, and so on. So it was called a T20 or a T25. Um, problem when the stock market crash came, of course I was margined up to my own balls, a bit like somebody having a lot of property with lots of mortgages, and I couldn't afford it. So I got into big, big trouble there, um, and that was my crashing end to my stock market career and uh, then I came out of, of um, the market space because it, there was just very little going on and how I made my first million, some people might have read about this, uh, we'll put the millionaire dropout, there was a guy called Richard Hughes and he had a phone delivered and I can even remember it was CityLink that delivered it and this phone was 1200 quid and it was an NEC like big brick phone, not the Motorola one but it was like an NEC one and I thought, there's got to be some money in this thing. And I thought, right, you know, this is a market I want to get into, but of course I've got no money. So I started buying and selling uh, phones, and a lot of them were car phones at the time. I had a little ad in the Sunday Times. Um, and I built up a business basically buying and selling phones. And that's what gave me the money to go back into trading and investing. Wow. So, so what was your big mistake when you were margined up to the eyeballs? What, what were some of the bets that you were making, uh, not bets that you were making, some of the stock market stock. chances you were, you, you were taking that, that went wrong? And that's the big mistake, like you said, it was margined, right? Because if I'd had enough money to withstand the, um, the falls, because if anyone goes back and has a look, if you've got something like ShareScope, you can go back to 1987, and you'll see the October fall, and it was dramatic, it was about 20% fall, so it, in terms it was a large fall. However, stocks actually came back quite quickly, you know, in terms of a year, year and a half. But if you haven't got the money to hold the stock, that's where you're in trouble. So probably the biggest lesson was about being over-margined. The other thing at that time, I was only buying, I wasn't going short, so I wasn't betting for things to go down. Um, I wasn't very diversified, I didn't have gold or anything like that. So I think the first lesson, and still very, very true today, is you know don't put all your eggs in one basket, be careful, it's all very well to look at, oh, this is the upside, but think about the downside. And can you remember anything in particular that went really badly for you in terms of, say, gold or phones, like you said, like phones were doing well for you? Was there a specific market that went bad for you? In, in the stocks, pretty much everything got sold <laughs> off. And it all started on a Friday afternoon, Friday evening. I'd already left. And you remember, this is again, it's pre-internet days, but it was Wall Street that already started dropping on the Friday. So by the time I'd got into Monday, um, and it's funny actually, when you talk about omens, a few weeks before there'd been a big storm in the UK. I remember I couldn't get into work and I had to get the, um, I got the coach into work and the markets were shut. And it was almost like that couple of weeks before was telling you something wasn't quite right. Yeah. Um, but it was just literally everything got sold just off. There was, there was nothing well. that sort of um, did well.